Thank you very much for joining me today, Roger. I'm speaking with Roger Hallam, who is fresh out of his latest uh, slap down by the legal authorities for his corrupting the youth of, of England, or I think that's what they're most concerned about, by introducing them to the, the incredible notion that we may have strayed over planetary boundaries and be falling fast. And your claim to fame, Roger, as one of the co-founders of the Extinction Rebellion, otherwise known as XR. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, yeah, I'm a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, um, and I've also helped more recently set up a, what we're calling an anti-political party to put candidates up uh, on the climate emergency. Anti-political party, can you tell me a bit more about that? That's new to me. Yes, well, as, as you may know, uh, Extinction Rebellion was set up to um, persuade governments to create citizens' assemblies to discuss and decide what to do about the climate crisis. <clears throat> and citizens' assemblies are a very sort of unique institution in so much as they are a gathering of people that are selected randomly from the population. And so they can't be gained or influenced by the rich and powerful. So you just get ordinary people coming together and then they have plenty of time to deliberate and find out the facts and figures as it were on a subject and come to what you might call a sensible, compassionate or rational sort of outlook on a subject. And for Extinction Rebellion, a main plank of what we're saying is that citizen assemblies should be deciding the future of our children, not politicians influenced by the rich and powerful and what have you. And Burning Pink was set up to say that the, the political system should be based around citizen assemblies rather than politicians who are open to corruption and other influences. And it's that corruption, I'll add, is not necessarily the slip something in your back pocket kind, but it's endemic. It's part of the system that money gets a louder voice. It's easier for the Bill Gates Foundation, for instance, to schedule a meeting with Minister of England than it is for, say, Roger Hallam, who is a force to be reckoned with, a force of nature, but not the well, we want to deal with. Yes, I mean, the big thing about what I'm about is not simply complaining and feeling miserable and defeatist about the rich and powerful controlling everything, which of course has been a narrative in progressive or left-wing circles for you know several decades. I've spent most of my life going, asking the question, not why things are bad, but what to do about them, which is a quite different question. And obviously, as things have become more and more horrendous, more and more people are making that transition from a sort of cosy, things are really bad, let's all be miserable together sort of orientation to a, well, what actually needs to happen here? And what we need, of course, is a pathway towards a more sane society. And that pathway, arguably, is through citizens' assemblies. I mean, obviously, there's a number of different ways of doing these things. But citizens' assemblies have a very big sort of attraction, which is they are based upon ordinary people. So you were saying these citizens' assemblies have a greater impact, and that's the way people want to be governed by, we call them in the US town halls, but they've grown bigger than towns. Yes, uh, yes, the essential characteristic is people selected randomly. Um, so it's not just who turns up, because that tends to be more privileged people than what have you. If you if you if people are picked randomly, then you know 30% of the population here are people of colour, then they'll have 30% in, in the citizens' assemblies, and you know, there'll be half women, half men, and all the rest of it. So what, what's really fantastic about them is they're a genuine expression of the popular will. And this is a lot more attractive proposition than you know the traditional puritanical green, we know what's best for you sort of message that has been very prominent over the last 30 years. And people not surprisingly react against that. But if you're saying to people, look, if we all sit down and have a mature adult discussion about what really is going on, then you know it's not surprising, of course, that people will suddenly 
wake up and and want to do whatever's necessary to preserve their families and their community and their nation and and that's the that's the primary objective here there's a certain sort of mathematics to it dare i say it which is obviously you don't want five people because you know you could get a biased number on the other hand you don't need a thousand so um, yeah, you can the, the the industry average as you might say is something between 100 and 300 people okay um i mean you can go up to a thousand but that's not really necessary the main thing is the quality and uh, the seriousness of the deliberative process, as you might say. Like people need enough time to relax into hearing the evidence, a little bit like a jury trial, where they get lots of different views, and through that they collectively decide what the reality is. The you know the optimal idea is that is that the citizens' assembly is created by the state and is legally binding, and that's the idea of the anti-political party burning pink, which is is to replace replace you know parliamentary parties or the Democrats and the Republicans in the states with citizens' assemblies. What I'd like to focus on today is your own evolution from farmer in Wales to arguably one of the most notable figures in the world in the within the community of people trying to do something serious about climate change. How did you develop from farmer into uh, activist as you as you are today? Well, as I was saying to you before this interview, uh, before this year, I think I've grown vegetables, organic vegetables for 34 years. But so this is the first year I haven't actually grown veg. Um, uh, though I've been more or less full time uh, on on my civil disobedience work and exile work for five years now. I, I don't think my story is particularly original in the sense of I'm sure lots of people watching a video have gone through that same process of denial and cognitive dissonance and then, you know, having that talk to yourself, you know, that it's time to grow up and see the reality as it is. And then realising more significantly, I suppose, that it's not enough just to have an opinion that we have a right and a duty to rebel against governments that are perpetuating what will be seen as the greatest crime in human history, you know, namely to destroy the prospects for future generations in full knowledge of what you're doing, which of course is the case now. Or in, so, in full knowledge, as I like to uh, say. Well, yeah, we can discuss, you know, willful ignorance and all the rest of it. But in a court of law, as we're all aware, uh, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. It's not an excuse in normal Western societies. It wasn't an excuse at Nuremberg. And it won't be an excuse in the trials that come in the future when people start to experience the horrendous consequences of this murderous, you know, uh, proposition that the elites have put forward over the last 30 years that they'll promote the fossil fuel industry over the the common good and the national interest so I don't really have something particularly original at least or, or other than to say that as an organic farmer I used to employ a fair number of people and like many farmers around the world extreme weather conditions has decimated my business and I'm not a big farm you know I don't have lots of different farms I'm what you might call a small farmer 15 acres but it was a substantial enterprise and it was one of the biggest uh, organic delivery systems in Wales where I, where I used to live and I think in I think it's 2006 or somewhere around that time it rained every day for seven weeks which is a one in a thousand year event, roughly speaking. And after four weeks, every single vegetable was rotted away. And I lost an enormous amount of money and everyone I employed lost their jobs. And I spent five years trying to crawl out of debt <laughs> as a result of this. And, and it won't surprise people to know that the following week, it rained for seven weeks approximately as well in the summer. And then we had the warmest spring on record. And then we had the coldest winter on record. I think it was minus 15 for a fortnight and we lost all our winter crops uh, and you know every two or three years uh, farmers all around the world are experiencing extreme weather events that destroy their ability 
to grow food and maintain their businesses. And this is something that's going to get exponentially worse, of course. So I suppose if I am different, most people have a visceral understanding of the terrible power of nature to destroy the ability of human beings to survive because you don't need to be a genius to work out that if lots of farmers have their crops destroyed, then we're going to have mass starvation. And that's the horrendous and you know infinitely upsetting prospect that we now are confronted with. Well, you, you are correct in that you've taken the path that many people have taken through avoidance, denial, uh, contemplation, fright, the whole evolution. But you arrived in a, a place that's unique for your particular personality, which is that you said, by golly, I'm going to get up and do something about it. And that do something about it turned out to be very creative and very effective. What I'd like to come out of our conversation together is that people around the world who go through that process of realizing um, the, the deep kimchi, as we say, I don't know where I come from now, Hawaii, deep kimchi, which kimchi is a very, very spicy hot cabbage. And if you're in deep kimchi up to here, you're, you got the same problem. A lot of people have come to that same conclusion, but are not turning the corner into being as creatively activist as you have been. And I would like this video to be an inspiration to people to become more active. Yes, well, it, it, it's, it's important to understand, I think, there's two elements here that are sort of new as, as I see it. And there are the two elements that were promoted at the beginning of Extinction Rebellion. And Extinction Rebellion has grown, I would argue, on the basis of these two ideas. And as, as you may know, you know, it only started two years ago with 15 people in, in a cafe in, in Bristol in the UK. And it spread, you know, to 60, 70 countries around the world. There's 200,000 people on the mailing list in the UK. And it's the biggest social movement that's, that exists in Britain and many other countries. And the reason for this is quite, quite, quite counterintuitive because it's taken a very different approach to what you might call the conventional climate movement or the NGOs. And, and the two main ideas are, number one, that you need to um, see the truth, right? With a capital T, <laughs> you know, um, to tell the truth, to see the truth and to tell the truth. And then secondly, to act upon that truth as if it's real. So this, this all, as far as I'm concerned, is a matter of being rooted in a tradition. And the tradition of most cultures is centered around the notion of truth. And the reason for that is if a society departs from the truth in a deep sense, then it's on the way to self-destruction. And this is part of you know, many traditions. The tradition I'm from, uh, what you might call uh, Calvinist, Methodist, liberal tradition of the North of England. And the big phrase in the North of England is, you know, call a spade a spade, right? <laughs> in, in other words, you know, if, if shit's happening, then it's happening, right? And you face it. And, and that's what it is to have a mature character. That's what it is to be an adult. That's what it is to be responsible enough to bring up children, is to be able to see what the threats are to your children and act appropriately. And as I say, you know, that's it's a, it's nothing particularly unique, though we're all part of different traditions. And for me, being brought up in a, you know, in a Methodist Christian household, it was really drummed into me at an early stage that the most important thing in life is to live in truth, regardless of the consequences. And, and that's a powerful idea because it means you don't compromise in order for expediency. And of course, most of our culture is centered around the opposite idea, which is, does it work? <laughs> you know, will it, will, it, will it enhance my status? Uh, and all that sort glasses. of thing. Sorry? Rose colored glasses. Rose colored glasses, yeah. And uh, we, you go into any institution around the world. And the key question is not if it, not, 
is this true, but what will it do for us? In other words, if the truth will undermine our income stream, then we won't go for the truth. And of course, this is what most of the civil, civil society organizations around the Western world do. They'll look at something and go, oh, we don't want to tell the truth about climate because you know it's too upsetting and people will give us less money and all the rest of it. This is the point I bring into every conversation I have, which you've brought into for me, which is kind of my claim to notability that I was, as far as I know, the first one to say on a UN stage that money, capital M, is a virus. It's a virus of the mind, a meme that controls us for its own reproductive purposes and promotes to the highest levels of control and power in government and industry, those people who are the most willing to sacrifice the truth for financial bottom line. And yes, and, and yes, and this is, you know, I, I've got a film out about me and, and some, some, another person called The Troublemaker. And basically the theme of that film is that this is actually a very old story in, in humankind. You know, for instance, it, you know, it features very strongly in the Old Testament and it, it features in other traditions uh, where people get mis misled by worldly greed to use an old word for it mm -hmm. and and it's it ends in tears right that's mm -hmm. the moral mm -hmm. and people depart from the way of god or these other phrases but basically that means the way of self-evident truth and if you do that as a culture then you're on the road to annihilation mm -hmm. and destruction and obviously there's a religious interpretation of that but there's also a secular interpretation and i'm yeah. a social scientist at you know king's college in london and all of my research and you know, there's plenty of other research on it which which points to societies falling apart on the basis of this sort of moral corruption yeah. so you can look upon it practically if you like you know whatever floats your boat i don't really mind the point is 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 if we tell ourselves enormous lies then we are committing the the ultimate wrongdoing and um and that's, I think, the reason why Extinction Rebellion has been so successful around the world, because it has that integrity at its core. In other words, we didn't set up Extinction Rebellion in order to become successful. We set up Extinction Rebellion because we believe that the truth is an end in itself. And paradoxically, of course, um, yeah, it became successful as a result. And much of my research is based upon this idea that the people that are most affected uh, paradoxically, in terms of bringing about political change, are people that are primarily concerned with bringing about political change. They're concerned about their own spiritual and moral integrity, and and that's what that's what brings about the change. Now, there's the other element to it. Just while I get this in, of course, is is it's all very well, you know, believing in the truth, but it's. Uh, it's no use and you're undermining your own integrity if you don't act upon the truth and this is where you know the rubber hits the road <laughs> as, as uh, you may be aware which is that if you act upon that truth then uh, societies will put you in prison without beating around the bush and that has happened many times in history and it's happening again now and i've been in prison several times and been arrested many times and I've been on two hunger strikes and what have you. And the point is here is you cannot have integrity at a time of genocidal intent by your government if you do not enter into civil resistance against that government. Oh. And there isn't, for me, any dispute about that. You know, the climate catastrophe is not an optional extra. It's not a social issue. It's 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 the greatest crime in the history of humanity. Yeah, it, because it, we're looking at the complete collapse of life on Earth, and I dare anyone to suggest any crime is greater than that. Particularly if you know what's happening, and we do know what's happening, and the elites know what's happening. So, well, now, okay, you've gotten two classes in there. You said we do know what's happening, but that we is a relatively small 
portion of the seven to eight billion people alive now, and our governments know what's happening, and they are also numerically a very small portion. So it's not everybody knows what's happening. And part of the problem is that the traditional media is not doing an adequate job of telling the truth either. So part of the civil disobedience needs to be in terms of boycotts and marches outside of the offices. We need to get their attention as well. It's a very complex problem. I know you've been through all parts of it. You and I have been working on different parts, but I'd like to merge. Yes, I, I, I think you're right. Like the media does have a role in this, but uh, a lot of progressive people and what have you overestimate the role of the media in terms of creating change. Uh, I mean, it's a complicated subject, but the upshot of it is, is that political change comes about through the sacrifice of resistance. That's the main mechanism. In other words, like people can get as much information as they like, but only when they experience people sacrificing themselves for the greater good, will they sort of viscerally and emotionally engage with a reality. In other words, like we mainly like, we mainly look at acts rather than words when we're thinking about things. And one of the greatest sort of disasters, in my opinion, of the conventional climate movement is it's relied too much on the idea that you give people information and then they'll, you know, change. Well, as we should all know, people don't change if they find information inconvenient. And if they find it highly inconvenient, they change even less. You know, and how people change is basically through being presented with the moral challenge of disruption. And there's a rich and honourable tradition, of course, through the 20th century, through Martin Luther King and Gandhi and what have you, of people saying, we've had enough of talking, we've had enough of being nice, now we're going to create disruption. And if you want to jail us and if you want to arrest us and all the rest of it, then so be it. And when that happens on a large scale, that's when you get structural change. And that's how change happens in the most rapid way. Now, whether or not you agree with that morally, the fact of the matter is that's an empirically robust observation. That well, the most you... effective way of changing societies is through this methodology. And that's the basis of Extinction Rebellion and Burning Pink, and that's what I'm about. Personally, I agree with the, the um, strategy morally, ethically, on all levels, spiritually and scientifically. But if those acts of civil disobedience are, are boycotted by the mainstream media, then it's few people who know it, unless you happen to be lucky enough to be able to, to cut off five Thames River crossings and stop London for, for a period of time. But, um, well, I suppose a similar round of civil disobedience in New York, there are only a limited number of, of bridges and tunnels that connect Manhattan with its uh, supply of labor, daily labor. So it could be done also. But, but um, my point is that we also need to let people know about the civil disobedience and a mailing list of 200,000, as good as it is, is fewer people than can be reached by the uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. I'm mentioning the the good with the questionable. Wall Street Journal is a Murdoch property and cherry picks what it'll print and not what not. Um, but we need to get a very robust response from, from the media. But yes, by all means, keep on with the civil disobedience. I, um, I try to maintain a very, um, I don't know, a non-confrontational perspective in a certain way, which brings individuals who are very confrontational to as wide an audience as they want to go to. Uh, yes, and I, I think it's important to not over strategize and over analyze what we're trying to do here, right? Well, I think one of the biggest problems with our lack of success is this sort of obsession with trying to work out what will work, as I've said. I mean, obviously it's important to a certain extent, I and mean, we all live in the real world, but the the fundamental point here is the world changes when people are so disgusted that they act regardless of the consequences. And what we need to do is to enhance that feeling of disgust. In other words, it's emotionally driven at the end of the day. 
you know, it's 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 the absolute horror of thinking that your children are likely to starve to death or they're going to be sent to some war to stop, you know, migrants coming to your country mm. or they're going to be raped because of breakdown in your neighbourhood. These, these are the sort of realities that the climate emergency actually means. I mean, no one's going to die of the climate, right? You know, in the sense way, same way as people don't die of AIDS, right? people die of the secondary effects and the secondary effects are what we're only just starting to talk about because for 30 years the debate has been dominated by certain middle class euphemisms right you know like social disruption social what ex what exactly does that mean and a big part of telling the truth is to say in everyday language exactly the sort of things that people are going to experience you know that most of the people in the southwest of the United States are going to have to evacuate their homes in the next, you know, 20 years. The people in Florida are going to have to evacuate their homes in the next 30, 40 years. You know, most people in the southern United States are going to become economically stressed. Let's put it like that. You know, they're going to lose their jobs, their pensions. They're going to have to flee their homes. There's going to be riots on the street. There's going to be murder. There's going to be rape. This is what it means. It doesn't mean penguins are going to die in Antarctica, although they are. And this is the role of people from now on, I think, is to be brutally honest with people about what's happening. And I think paradoxically, people will respect you more for doing that because people instinctively want to know at a certain point what the reality is in the same way as, you know, if you're ill and you go to the doctor, uh, you eventually decide you want to know what's happening. Oh, and, and this is the process tens and hundreds of millions of people are going through in the world at the moment. And I talk to many people who are distraught because they've been in denial and then they've suddenly realised that, you know, physics is real and billions of people will starve to death. That's, that's what we're looking at. And we need to be strong enough to deal with that information and on the basis of that information, do what is necessary to minimise the pain and suffering that's coming down the line. And of course, that's very difficult, but that's, that's, that is what I predict will happen over the next five years. You derive no income, no personal gain whatsoever in financial terms from Extinction Rebellion, do you? No, I, 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 we did, we did give people uh, uh, what's it called um, living expenses, but then we ran out of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, so I've just, I've just um, created a fundraiser so that I can pay my, you know, my expenses. Okay. But um, it shouldn't surprise you that if you're a small-scale organic farmer, you get used after a decade or two of living on very little. And um, that's absolutely fine with me. I've got no material ambitions at all, but I do need to pay the bills in order to work the 60, 70 hours a week that I do. Yes, so after, after I say goodbye to you and you leave the conversation, I'm going to speak with the audience a little bit more about that fundraiser and, and leave yeah. it, it because my conviction is to try to assist you to have a source of income so that you can continue to inspire and lead this movement. Yes, and I think I think without sounding too practical as it were the, the fact of the matter is changing society is a highly skilled activity it's actually very difficult to do it, it, you know it's not like you just go out one day and start campaigning it's a very complex human activity and it requires a lot of experience and training and people that are good at it are very good at it and it's essential that people are funded so that they can do this job. One of the most vital ways in which we're going to deal with the climate emergency is by paying highly skilled activists around the world to do their job so that they don't have to go and work in a pub or something, <laughs> a bar, right? Which yeah. is, you know, outrageous, I think, at this stage in the emergency, that these highly skilled individuals around the world 
aren't being supported. And of course, they're not the sort of people that are going to work for some wealthy NGO or UN agency, right? But well, what we know is it's these people that are creating change in the world, right? It's not the bureaucrats and the politicians. It's the people that are creating social movements. And it's not like they need a mega box, you know, they just need to be able to pay the rent. So if people are going to support, you know, progress on the climate emergency, one of the most effective ways they can do that is by funding people like myself to get on with the job. Okay, well, that's going to be my job. Uh, when I yeah. publish this is to help get you to a level of, of income where you don't have to worry about sleeping on friends' couches. Uh, yeah. <laughs> literally, when I, when I started what I was doing, I was, I still am paying my own way, and I, but I started out with couch surfing. Uh, yes, well, I was, I, I've been effectively homeless for four years now because I couldn't afford any rents in London. Yeah. So I used to sleep in the PhD room at my university <laughs> and uh, in my car. So, you know, this is the this is the background to Extinction Rebellion, right? It's not some well-funded NGO sort of project. You know, it's ordinary people from ordinary occupations deciding that they've had enough. Yeah. And, you know, whatever it takes is necessary to, to build social movements. And obviously, we've had great success, but with... Um, you know, there's so much more to do, right? We're just, we're still on the foothills, if the truth be known, on what we need to do. And every month and year that goes by, the challenge becomes exponentially greater, as, as you're aware, you know. So this, it's a mad, mad world, isn't it? <laughs> because you're facing an exponentially worse, you know, if I say this to people, like, if it's not, you know, if you take something like slavery, obviously it's, you know, absolutely obscene and outrageous slavery happened but one of the things about slavery is if it didn't sort it this year it would still be there next year but it wouldn't be like 10 times worse and and this is one of the things we have to convey to people is we simply don't have the time to mess around here you know we simply don't have the time to not take great risks because it's potentially already over and if it's not already over now it certainly will be in 10 years and that's the most terrible information, isn't it? I mean, it, it stresses me out every day. <laughs> In terms yeah. of taking great risks, I don't know if you've been able to hear it during our conversation, but uh, let me hold this up in front of my face so people can see it with my virtual background. Um, here we go. It's a, it's a noisemaker. It's a little pump that pumps a little shot of chemotherapy into my into my heart, actually, um, every minute or so, because I. Oh, right, yeah. And and so I am personally taking a certain amount of risk in continuing to do what I do, but it's my commitment and my job. It's 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 the reason I'm here. Yeah, and thanks so much, Stuart. Really appreciate all the work you're doing. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. And vice versa. Thanks. Bye. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us for this long. And I want to come to, uh, for me, what's one of the points of this conversation, which is that Roger Hallam, who I regard as a, an indispensable aid to our progress through the current catastrophe that's happening to humanity, both known and unknown, depending upon what circles you're talking about. Uh, Roger's required, and yet he is homeless, sleeping uh, on people's couches and whatever from, from one place to the next. And he has a Patreon fundraiser by which he's trying to raise a, a minimum monthly in, income by which he can rent his own apartment, afford some food, afford utilities, um, so I would like to show you that. This is Roger's Patreon page. From this moment, despair ends and tactics begin. And there's a little insert with the Extinction Rebellion uh, uh, logo in black and white and a little cameo of Roger, which is the, the cleanest cut I've ever seen him. That's probably when he uh, still had an income. 
Roger Hallam is creating a global climate change revolution. Help Roger get on with it. I can't uh, emphasize that enough. Now, the, he's British, and so um, the levels are set up in terms of pounds and dollars. There are more levels for more for contributions of, of greater uh, amounts, but there are still just those three perks. So it's basically whatever you feel you can afford uh, would be appreciated. The address for his Patreon page is quite simply uh, patreon.com slash Roger Hallam, H-A-L-L-A-M. But please check the link that will be popping out at various points during this uh, entire video. Um, and do share the video with your, with your friends. Please subscribe to our channel uh, and uh, come to facingfuture.earth, our companion website, and uh, join there as well. So we'll have you on our mailing list. Um, thank you. And uh, do take care of, of yourself and uh, your families, friends in this age of COVID, which is likely to be with us for a good while longer. Thank you, goodbye.